Let me give just a second for our attendees to get into the um, meeting here. You can see they're, they're starting to come in. Of course, this broadcast will be available to the industry on the RIA YouTube channel here shortly. I'll give just about 15 more seconds for uh, folks to come in and we'll get started. Brandon, you're able to see my screen okay? Absolutely. Excellent. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started, folks. Welcome to the RIA industry briefing. We've got uh, some great content here again for everyone who's able to join us today. I'm very pleased to again have Mr. Brandon Burton with us to give us an update on the joint RIA IICRC collaborative effort for the COVID-19 response within the industry. Uh, some great publications are now available to uh, the industry through RIA and IICRC's joint effort. Brandon will be giving us that update. We're also so pleased to have Patty Harmon with us, who of course doesn't need much introduction to RIA members as she was the editor for many years of Cleaning and Restoration magazine and, and certainly involved in a lot of different projects within RIA over the years. Uh, she will be speaking now from the vantage point of her role in the industry, which is aligned with the re property restoration industry, but not on necessarily the side of the fence of contractors anymore, but rather through the uh, lens of the magazine that she currently is the editor of, which is Claims Magazine. There was an article that caught our eye not long ago called The Coming Claims Tsunami. And so that, of course, is something that will be very relevant and interesting to the property restoration industry. She's going to speak a little bit more to us about that. And then uh, last but not least, we have Craig Kersemeyer. Craig has uh, been heavily involved in the restoration industry over the years. He's a brand new uh, elected board member for the RIA. He, of course, has many years of involvement with the ISCRC and as uh, I've said before, in other RIA functions, Craig was one of the individuals who was instrumental in the RIA IICRC agreement uh, that was initiated last year and has been bringing huge returns for the property restoration industry. My name is Mark Springer. I'm a restoration contractor and operator out in Montana. Our company works across the state of Montana and I'm honored and uh, certainly very humbled to serve as the RIA uh, president here uh, as of just uh, uh, a few weeks ago. So uh, it's uh, part of our goal and part of our strategy as the Restoration Industry Association to communicate regularly with the industry about the things that are impacting and affecting restorers. And uh, certainly these briefings have been very popular with our constituents as we're able to bring information to them quickly and in real time. Uh, there's a very important announcement at the end of this briefing, so make sure to stay tuned for that uh, beyond uh, this call. Uh, we're gonna start off here first with Brandon, who's going to give us an update on the most recent update and second edition of the joint documents, Brandon. Uh, go ahead and take it away. We look forward to your update and what you have to tell us about where we're at right now. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, so the documents have been updated. And as Mark, as you indicated, they are now in their second edition. Um, the first thing I was going to share is just uh, just a real quick acknowledgement of the group that worked very very hard on on providing those updates uh, that were also very deeply involved in the in the initial uh, reports that came out so just a, a huge thank you to michael pinto uh, norris gearhart and mark drozdov uh, they participate in that joint task force directly uh, and also to a very long list of approximately 30 reviewers uh, who have actively been reviewing that content as it has been updated so i i just want to start by acknowledging them as truly the the true technical experts behind the document i kind of play more the role of the secretary and and making sure that everything's properly documented uh, but they're really the technical minds behind it so i want to acknowledge them um, so they have been updated and real quickly i'll, I'll run over just some high level uh, details about the update and and then go through a little bit of what's going to happen next um, as the obviously as, as covid 19 and as this pandemic continues information changes it's very very fluid and i know i stressed this in the the last briefing that we had 
Uh, but I, I want to continue to encourage uh, that although these documents have been updated, don't download the document, print the document, and then feel that that is, you know, the 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 uh, the information that's going to stay through the end of the pandemic. These documents are being updated very very regularly, which is part of the reason why I wanted to acknowledge Michael Norris and Mark because they continue to review a massive amount of information including the peer review comments so that we can ensure this information stays as current as possible. Uh, so the first note I'll provide is make sure that you have bookmarked the page on restorationindustry.org where the documents are located, download a copy, and then at least on a weekly basis, go back to that page and ensure uh, that you're using the most recent information uh, so that you stay current. The updates that were released in this most recent uh, version, I'll just kind of real highly gloss over these and, and note that this is not a replacement for reading the entire document, uh, but here are some of the areas where you're going to notice some significant change. Uh, there has been some language added in uh, to the documents in regards to treating all emergency service mitigation projects as though COVID-19 is a real and present concern on that project, uh, in particular when local federal or provincial regulatory bodies are still indicating that COVID-19 is a concern. Um, some, some of the intent behind that is that in some parts of the country, uh, the pandemic is, is less of a concern. In other parts of the, of the country, it's a greater concern. And really the best source of information to understand what's occurring in your local area, your local municipality, is by taking a look at your county or, or other local health organization and find out, do you have community transmission? Are you still having stay-at-home orders? And, and if you're in one of those scenarios or those situations, you really should be moving forward uh, treating each one of these projects as though it is a real and present uh, risk and hazard associated with your projects. Uh, so look for that language as good uh, kind of uh, background conversation around that. Uh, there continues to be a lot of language on the use of respiratory protection, eye protection, and hand protection as just general practice as we're operating in the mitigation space. Uh, there's also been a, a very significant uh, addition for how we go about the process of identifying uh, you know, alternative personal protection because of the shortages that we're seeing in, in particular in certain parts of the country. So I'd encourage you to read through that. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration is one of the references used now by the document for that conversation because they've got a great uh, set of information on how to select those alternatives. There's also a good discussion on documentation of those alternatives, uh, which I highly encourage that you review because as we make those types of, of, of changes in what we would normally use, it's really important important to document things like, you know, what was the alternative that was used, mm -hmm. why was it used, and how does that marry up to the particular job task? Uh, mm -hmm. Really critical as it relates to health and safety, documentation is key. Uh, there's also been a section added in and around ventilation. You know, one of the measures that's being discussed by the Centers for Disease Control to help reduce risk is to ensure that you're exchanging air inside of a work environment with fresh outdoor air so you can reduce the potential that there might be airborne viral fragments as you're doing work in that environment. You know, especially in, in emergency service and in mitigation, you know, there's a lot that we're doing while we have technicians on site that very easily could aerosolize, you know, a lot of dust and debris in particulate. Um, so that, that guidance is really good sound guidance from the Centers for Disease Control. What the documents now do is they take that guidance and they adapt that uh, given the considerations that we have for our specific industry. So again, a really good read that talks through the use of ventilation versus controlled ventilation versus the use of, of air filtration devices. Uh, so really good background information there. I'm kind of jumping over to uh, the document that addresses providing COVID-19 services uh, when COVID-19 is concerned for your client. So this would be the second document, so specific to providing COVID-19 services. There's been a phenomenal increase in the amount of information behind risk management, uh, behind considerations that you want to have in your business insurance, uh, in and around and related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Mr. David Dibdahl and Ed Cross for the work that they did mm -hmm. in reviewing that particular element of the document. They provided a, a massive amount of, of information that's great for consideration just to ensure that you're properly protected as an organization. Um, and if you haven't already seen some of that information, I'd highly encourage, especially business owners, general managers, those that deal with the overall assessment of risk as an organization, you know, give that a good read. And then finally, last but not least, uh, you know, the documents, again, aren't ending here. We're continuing to update the documents, add additional content at a cycle of approximately 
approximately every three to four weeks, just to give you a feel for the cadence. Um, one of the major efforts that's going to occur in the third edition of these report, reports is that we are going to combine them into a single document uh, mm -hmm. so that we don't have to go finding different documents you know, in, you know, in different places addressing these two topics. Uh, it really consolidates the effort of the joint task force uh, when we combine the two into a single document. Uh, that process is about a week underway already, uh, so I would anticipate that in two to three weeks that third edition will be ready and available and in, in circulation, depending upon uh, the amount of, of comments we get from peer review. So that's where they're at, that's where they're headed, and I would anticipate that sometime in early June we'll have another edition. Excellent. And Brandon, again, thank you for all you're doing. Obviously, uh, we could talk about this stuff for quite a while here today, but in the sake of time, we're going to keep moving. But thank you to you, all the Joint Task Force members, such an invaluable piece for the industry. And I'm excited about to see how this document will serve other purposes. It seems like these sort of pandemics that we face are a real kind of danger to our, our country and our communities. And so I think that beyond COVID-19, this will have a lot of value. Uh, I know they're working on an infection control uh, a standard as well now, the ICRC is. And so I think hopefully, hopefully that's my hope, some of this stuff will um, align some of the efforts that we have and, and facilitate an even quicker uh, uh, standard uh, to be brought to the industry. Yeah, it's an honor to serve in that capacity. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you so much. Patty uh, Harmon, I'm going to move over to you. Uh, Claims Magazine, I think before we kind of talk about this article that really piqued my interest, first of all, welcome. It's good to have you back with us here today. Could you talk just a little bit about Claims Magazine and who it's kind of in, uh, what its desired demographic is or who you guys are targeting as far as a readership? The magazine is uh, bi-monthly, comes out uh, yeah, six times a year, and it is geared primarily towards claims professionals, adjusters, claims managers, and claims executives, as well as risk managers, and um, we cover primarily property and casualty, um, auto, and workers' compensation. So the, the property and casualty piece I had before I got there, thanks to my years with RIA, everything else I've had to kind of learn on the job, but it's, yeah. it's been a great experience. I, I, I remember when I was in the CR school back, I mean, this is 2002, so a lot many years ago, I remember Marty King saying, if you want to know what's happening in the, pro, in the yeah. adjuster's perspective, right. you yeah. should read Claims Magazine. And of course, that was many years ago. I think CRs for a long time, there used to be an ad there. Yes, there the used CR. to be a three-page ad in there. So, yep. Yeah, yeah. So we don't have any more, but uh, still obviously some overlap there. Now, the, again, the article that caught my eye was this uh, title that says, The Coming Claim Tsunami. I think a lot of restorers have had no, like, there is no claims for a lot of people, or it's been very sparse. They've seen mm -hmm. this like reduction in claims. So intuitively, I've been thinking there's got to be, we know that claims are still happening. There are people right. maybe aren't reporting them or adjusters can't get to them. So this really caught my eye. Can you tell me more about what the premise of this is and how it may impact? Reports? Well, it's going to be, we're already beginning to see an incredible number of um, insurance claims related to the coronavirus, and they are expected to climb into the billions of dollars. In mm. terms of how the direct impact on restoration contractors, I think you're going to find that how you handle these claims is going to be very different going forward. And I'll get, mm. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the the claims that we're seeing are going to affect every line of insurance because of. Um, the event cancellations and airlines and that sort of thing, travel insurance was affected first. Now we're starting to see business interruption, which again is something that could affect restoration contractors. And so this article was basically a warning to the insurance industry saying, hey, be careful because this is what we're seeing on the horizon. And like I said, there isn't going to be a line of insurance that isn't affected. Mm -hmm. So it'll, it'll be very interesting to see what happens going on. And the number of class action lawsuits that we're following. I mean, it's just, it's going to take a long time to get through a lot of this. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's a couple different ways that I would think that restores are going to see impact, right? One would be the property claims that either right. have not been yeah. turned in yet. Okay. Right. So you're, you agree with that. Uh, the other one is going to be uh, the, the property claims that 
just have not um, been able, there hasn't been an adjuster yet who's been able right. to get to them, yep. right? So they either they haven't been turned in or they just haven't kind of made their way through the process. So those are kind of some obvious ways that we're probably going to see a lot of claims. Also, I would imagine there's a lot of commercial buildings that have been sitting empty, empty. Uh, right? right? Yep. So that, that would be another one. But what are some ways that you think, I mean, there's a lot of other ways this may affect restorers beyond just the property claims that they see can is there some ways that you can kind of think of or forecast ways that they may see an impact in their business beyond just latent claims or ones that haven't hit us yet well i think for the restorers i think that you could very possibly see workers comp claims related to this we're starting mm -hmm. to see a lot come in and everybody's thinking oh it's going to be just the first responders in the hospitals but there are going to be other companies that are directly expect um impacted by that. Healthcare claims will be another area because mm -hmm. anybody who's on your insurance, if they get mm -hmm. sick, it's going to affect you that way. But I, I spoke earlier that um, how adjusters um, investigate claims in the wake of the coronavirus could also affect the um, restoration contractors. And I think what you're going to see is a greater use of technology. Um, and you're seeing some of this now, particularly in the auto space, but it's going to come into the property space, I think, a lot more. In addition to drones, policyholders are going to be using apps to kind of adjust their own losses. And you're going to see a lot more of what they're referring to as touchless claims. Mm -hmm. And that means that um, people, for restorers, it's going to, you, you may be very well be the very first eyes on a loss after it's been reported to an insurance company. So think yeah. about that because policyholders are concerned about the way about who's coming into their house and a loss and it could be something just like a regular water loss. Yeah. Think of how it's going to change how you approach a client in in yeah. those terms. How do you say to them, "Hey, this is what we're doing to make sure that you're safe when our workers come into your environment." So there are going to be a lot of different things like that. I did a webinar yesterday and they were talking one about the lawsuits that we're going to, um, we were going to start seeing. And then they talked about what it's going to look like as different businesses start to open up. And I think mm -hmm. that's where you could also begin to see a lot more work and claims and some of it will be covered by insurance and some of it will not. So on the ones that are not going to be covered, I mean, I, I know this, I'm not trying to have you be a, a policy interpretation, but from just the areas that you guys talk about in the claims world, what are some examples of ones that you think of where people are going to, a restorer may get involved and there may not be coverage? Is there any ones that you can think of that, that restorers should be aware of and they should be asking maybe more clarifying questions on to avoid uh, well, uh, missing out? Think about the claim, think about the jobs that you've gotten where somebody says, someone in our environment, okay, take my office in New York. We're, we're based in New York City and someone in my office contracts the virus and mm -hmm. they say, okay, we need someone to come in and clean this. Mm -hmm. So it, that may or may not be covered by insurance. And a lot of these buildings that closed, it's going to depend on the type of liability insurance they have, property liability, general commercial liability, what mm. the exclusions are, because that, that is probably the single biggest piece of all of this, mm. is what types of exclusions exist within an insurance policy. Mm. And so that'll make a huge difference in whether or not something is going to be, be covered. And then, you know, think about just coming in and your processes and how you're going to have to change those to address it. So it's, a, there are a lot of different, it's not like we're going to be able to open up buildings and offices and everything's going to go back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to find that there are a lot of issues that have to be looked at and addressed before we even get to that point. Mm -hmm. And it'll be the same thing for you all as you look through, look at your work processes and what you're going to have to change and adjust. Mm -hmm. So as you were talking about all these billions of claims, I mean, I've heard even bigger numbers. I think it, it's such a potentially enormous number. Yes. You think about things like business interruption and, and the litigation, especially that may uh, relate to trying to, as people try to assign blame and so forth. This, this question, you may not be able to answer at all, but I'll ask it anyway. I told you I wouldn't ask any tough one. I'm going back on my word here with this one. Uh, but have you heard about any challenges that some insurers may face with just liquidity or solvency as yes. they, they look at these? I mean, not, I remember in the 08, 09 period and, and the federal government was providing enormous um, 
uh, you know, cushions to enormous insurers like AIG. I mean, obviously there's this whole kind of secondary market and with reinsurers and stuff, we don't often hear about those. Are you hearing anything about solvency? Is that something that restorers should be concerned about from just being able to get paid for what they do? I, I don't think that's an issue. One of the things that we have been watching is, um, a, I think it's seven states now have passed legislation or they are trying to pass legislation where they are almost mandating that insurance carriers have to provide business interruption insurance re related to the pandemic. So all of a sudden they have to pay for losses that premiums were not collected on, that were not priced. And so in that respect, I think it could affect the solvency of some insurers. I'm mm -hmm. not aware of any at this point in time because I, that are having issues with that, but it is something that the entire industry is watching because it's, if you allow the government to enter into a contract between a policyholder and an insurer, and they do it in the insurance space, what is to stop them from entering into your contracts or contract between a financial form, firm that doesn't perform the way they're supposed to because of the coronavirus? Where do you stop it? And how much access do you give the government to enter into those contracts and say, oh, you know what? We're, we're, we don't think this is a good agreement for these small businesses. And so we're going to rewrite it and we're going to mandate that you have to provide coverage. And I think that is really um, mm. creating a lot of concern within the insurance industry. Mm. So it'll, it'll, it'll we're, I've already, I'm aware of several different um, uh, major uh, lawsuits involving uh, restaurant chains and that sort of thing. So that this, we're just at the tip of the iceberg for this. Mm. And it's yeah. new. It's a new area for everyone. Yeah. Well, certainly, I think one. You know, restorers. One of the practical challenges they're going to face right now is that if this backlog happens and there's this level of risk, the, probably the responsiveness we're going to be seeing from adjusters is going to be tested. Right. Well, and that's why with the remote, one of the things you need to be aware of with the uh, um, with the touchless claims is there, the policy holder is gonna take pictures, send it to the insurer, they're gonna run it through their algorithm. And if they find that there is coverage and it's a covered loss and it's within the policy limits, they may very well send the payment to the policy holder. So now you're not going to be dealing with the insurer at all. You're gonna be dealing strictly with the policy holder. And what happens when you get on the premises mm -hmm. and you find out that, oh, well, there was more damage behind the wall than you thought, or the water damage is far more extensive, and it requires more than what the insurer has already paid. Well, now the policyholder is on the hook for that, because as far as the insurer is concerned, they've already paid that claim, and they right. are done. Wow. So you, you will definitely need to, you know, when you're, when you're the first eyes on, you're going to have to do a very thorough um, walkthrough yeah. to see what all is involved. So those are some really practical um, tips there. Well, I guess there may be folks who are interested in learning more about this and, and re actually reading this article. Is this, is this something that we would be able to maybe yes. post on our, is it publicly available? We could post it, it on is. our YouTube? Actually, we've been um, on propertycasualty360.com. The majority of our COVID-related coverage has been unlocked. And we have a tab at the top of the page and all of these are a lot of these articles, including this one are underneath of that tab. And this yeah. is, I'm glad you all are updating your papers because this is, yeah. this topic is changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was doing it hourly when we first started covering it and now it changes literally from day to day. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we'll try to uh, broadcast that to our audience. Okay. And uh, the other thing I think that may uh, be useful to you certainly might may, maybe worth a discussion with Mr. Burton on is providing those resources that RI and ICR, IICRC have collaborated on uh, to the claims community because I think as they look for, for guidance on that, uh, we've done a lot of the legwork for them. Just so you know, my heart's still with the restoration industry oh. and one actually one of the articles I'm working on, I'll be reaching out to some folks, is what happens now after we start to open up, what does clean look like? And so that's why I'm really excited because I've been checking the RIA website to see what the pro progress is on this document so I can make sure that we're, we're reporting the most accurate information. Well, that's excellent. Well, we, we're glad to hear that you still have a soft spot in your heart for us restorers. Patty, it's great to see you again. Thank you for joining us. And we'll make that resource available on our Facebook page. We'll post that link there. 
Um, Patty, I'm, I'm, there may be some questions here at the very end. If you don't mind hanging around okay. and talk to That's Craig, fine. that'd be great. Okay. All right, so uh, our next guest here on today's briefing is Craig Kersemeyer. Craig, uh, welcome to the RIA Board of Directors. We're uh, glad to have you with us. Of course, RIA had its first competitive election this year and, and you managed to withstand the competition there uh, in that. Um, as you come here, obviously you got a ton of experience. Um, and and I, I thought it would be useful for our members to hear from you, from your vantage point, as to, first of all, what are some of the chief challenges that you see right now uh, in the property restoration industry? Well, thank, first of all, thank you. It's an honor to be part of the RIA Board of Directors, and uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm with such a, a great team. Um, I kind of break it down into two different areas. You know, you got your pandemic challenges, and then you have the industry challenges. I think... Mm -hmm. When you look at the pandemic challenges, and it was touched on, claim volume is one of them. I mean, it's, it's, it's off. Uh, obviously, cash flow, um, everything has slowed down from, you know, all, all different sides of it. Um, another one to think about is eventually getting the employees back to work. Um, I mean, there are some pretty good incentives uh, by the government to keep people not wanting to come back to work by, by some of the funding that they've gave towards them. Yeah. So, you know, if this tsunami hits, we're going to need more people and where are we going to be able to find them? So I think that's going to slow a process down. Mm. When I look at industry challenges I see, that I see out there, it's the same ones. It's, you know, you, you have the struggle with the TPAs, the, 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 the consultants, TPCs, but also like this is the pricing platforms, you know, do they, do they truly reflect our industry or our current industry where we're at? And I think a lot of the things um, that, you know, the, the, the RIA is doing by, 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 by taking a good hard look at those. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's interesting you bring that up, Craig, because I, I was actually talking to a restorer yesterday down in Arizona, and he said, you know, one of the big challenges we have right now is that um, folks can stay at home for $21 an hour right now. And, you know, in, for example, the, the wage rate in Exactware that bases a cleaning tech is, in his particular market, is $13 an hour. So, it is there's such a huge delta between those two that that it, it, it's really definitely a factor uh, for restores everywhere. So I'm glad you touched on that. What so what are some ways as you obviously now you're familiar with RIA's strategic plan and you're you're getting uh, more information about what what RIA is trying to do. What are some of the things that you think that RIA can be doing to positively impact the industry beyond, beyond the things you already touched on? I think one of the big things is, and, and what they have done is by by taking part of that leadership role in our industry or some of the allied industry uh, things that we look at. I mean, even though some people might say it's restoration, it's cleaning, and there's different silos that people are at, but at the end of the day, people are all going to be looking for safe, healthy solutions. They integrate together. And mm -hmm. I think when people can reach across the table, very much like IICRC and RIA and like we do it with the thing we did with, with NAPCA in regards to that, putting that kind of stuff out, that's key mm -hmm. and important. It's putting us all in the same field together. We're a unified group, and I really would like to see us continue to keep uh, reaching out to IAQA, all the groups that are involved, to get us all on the same page together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unified industry certainly is going to benefit all of us. Um, so you uh, run a successful company in Wisconsin. Um, so I'm guessing you're, you know, a big Badger or something like that. Are you Badger? Is that a uh, Badger and Packers? There you go, Badgers and Packers. There's a lot of lot of uh, success there in those uh, uh, organizations. Um, so people obviously see someone like yourself you've been involved in the icrc for a long time the ri the industry as a whole and, and certainly a, a lot of folks i'm sure who will watch this or who are watching it would would look up to uh, someone like yourself so what would be a piece of advice if you were going to give some new restore someone who's new to the industry uh, or even a veteran uh, a piece of advice just from your many years of experience what would what would that piece of advice be that you would offer to your fellow restores I think I could break it down in a couple of different things. One right now, and this is whether it's in this pandemic uh, arena or remember, you know, it's, it's an old word, cash is king. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you know, if you have that, you control a lot of your destiny from mm -hmm. what projects you want to take on at what margins you want to take on um, to, you know, to, to acquiring different things. So I think, you know, in, it sounds simple and we've all heard it, but I, I know I, 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 I believe in it. The other thing during this time, it, it, when things are a little bit slower, like, this gives you the opportunity to really evaluate your, your business, evaluate 
your staff, the systems and procedures you have in place. Sometimes you're in it so much you don't get a chance to take a step away to look at it. And with things being a little slower right now, um, at least for us, you know, you, you get a chance to look at, at that. Hmm. The other thing I think is important that, that, that people come to is the training right now. Sometimes you hmm. neglect some of that training because you're so busy doing the work right. that you're not taking the, the, taking the time to do the training. You know, one night right now, the IICRC, which is typically people had to go to classes, they're doing so much of this stuff online right now. Hmm. And as a business owner that's geographically challenged in central Wisconsin, um, I can do it for a lot less money by getting these people their certifications yeah. and their education because, yeah. it, you know, for me to send somebody, was always sending them to Chicago, to send yeah. them to Milwaukee. I had rooms and hotels and all the things that were involved. Right now you can take advantage of that, and I think uh, it's smart in the marketplace for these people to realize that yeah. and to offer some of their products that way. Yeah, well, Craig, that's uh, uh, really a great uh, tip there. And I think, you know, something that anyone who's watching this should be looking for for the first time in many, many years, RA will be offering its advanced designations online. Of course, that's in partnership now with ICRC. And I, I just, I mean, I'm in the same boat as you out in Montana. I put someone, I lose two days, put them on an airplane each way, the cost of airfare, all that, that, uh, hotel cost and so forth. And so for someone, we've got the brand new FLS uh, fire loss specialist that just came out. That's gonna be the first one that's gonna be available to folks. So uh, certainly uh, a very good opportunity and something this pandemic has forced us into that I think has a lot of value for, for the restoration industry. Uh, Craig, thanks for being here. Thank you for everything that you've done for the property restoration industry. Looking forward to serving with you over uh, the next few years as we work together on behalf of restorers uh, here in this industry to make it better. As we always talk about the way I put it to folks is let's just leave this better than we found it. And you're a guy I know that shares that uh, vision. Um, okay, folks, so that concludes our main content here for today. I do want to talk, though, about uh, something I'm sure that's on the minds of a lot of folks, and that is uh, what about this video that came out from Exact where we were so pleased to have Mike Fulton with us there at the virtual conference a few weeks ago. Mike made some significant statements about Exactware, which were put out uh, online and uh, have had over 20, uh, around 2,100 views uh, since we released that. And so certainly striking a nerve in the property restoration industry. Uh, as important as that is, we know that that is really just one small facet of a much larger discussion. And so we're excited to continue this discussion at the next industry briefing that we have on May 21st. It'll be the same time that we've had these. So two Thursdays from now, Mike will be our special guest and we are gonna have a much larger discussion. We had so many questions pouring in uh, to us that folks want to address with, a, with an issue that of course is very sensitive. We wanna present this issue fairly. And we also want to be able to see a lot of the areas where we face challenges right now uh, change in a way that's sustainable for this industry. And we are so glad that we are having this conversation with Exactware uh, because they're hearing and they're listening to what, what are the big concerns that we have now. Now, this briefing, because of the nature, we do not, we're not going to broadcast this everywhere. Uh, Mike is committed to having this discussion with RIA and its members. And so this will be exclusive. This next uh, briefing that we have. It will be a one-hour briefing. It will not be 30 minutes. It will be a one-hour briefing, and uh, and Mike really wants to make sure that it's the start of a discussion, which of course delights us. We want to have a long-term, proactive, and productive discussion with Exactware, and so that will be a RIA member exclusive. You need to be an RIA member uh, to be able to uh, participate in or listen to or get access to that information. It will not be put up on our YouTube channel for everyone. It will be specific for uh, the members of the RIA. So we will have a lot more exclusive things coming for our members. Uh, if there's ever a time that it makes sense as a restoration company owner to belong to RIA, it's right now. We have so many important issues that we face. Uh, a lot of stuff we do make available to the public domain, but uh, we will be having position statements and policies that will be released here. Uh, some of them will be available to the general public, but some of them will be available only to our members. Uh, some of them are gonna be very important and very transformative, especially as they relate to third-party consultants. Uh, if, if uh, like I said, if there's value uh, that RA can bring to its members, I think that you will see significant value uh, here over the rest of this year, even in the midst of this pandemic.
So we certainly we thank uh, everyone who is able to uh, join here. Anyone that wants to jump off, certainly feel free as we've exhausted our time. Uh, but I'm just going to check really quick to see if there's any questions uh, for uh, folks directly to the members of the panel here. Uh, one, uh, I'm just looking at the chat here. I might not be able to hit too many of these. Uh, this one looks like it's for uh, Patty from Brandon Burton, one of our panelists. Question is, how often are carriers now cutting checks directly to policyholders? Uh, how much has changed here in the wake of COVID-19 via touchless claims? Patty, is there anything that you know about that? I'm not sure if that's something you would know or not, um, um, I but... Uh, I don't know a lot and I like in terms of how often they're cutting them. One of the things that I do know is an option is that they can just do direct deposit into a policyholder's bank account. Now there are a lot of other ways to pay besides uh, just a paper check at this point in time. So hmm. I think yep. that could expedite some of these payments. And that's one of the things that the insurers want to do is, is get these folks paid as quickly as possible once they've been able to verify coverage and that it's a covered loss. We have one other comment here. This is not so much a question. I'll see. I'm, I'm just reading the first sentences. I might be. It's from Ed Cross, of course, our uh, restoration advocate, uh, who uh, has uh, always a, an important voice here in these issues. He says this comment. I'm just going to read it here. Uh, it's true that some carriers like to consider themselves, quote unquote, done once they make a payment, but a first party insurance claim is not a speak now or forever hold your peace proposition. The insured does not automatically lose the right uh, rights to coverage if an initial claim is incomplete. The carrier is not relieved of further coverage obligations by making an initial payment. Unlike third party claims, carriers do not receive releases once they issue uh, payment on a first party claim. If additional damage is discovered, insureds can and should submit the evidence to the carrier. So uh, that uh, I think is an important comment, whether or not uh, I think sometimes folks maybe feel uh, pressured or they don't realize what rights and remedies they have, that may be a separate issue. Patty, any comments on Ed's uh, general statement? I would agree and I'm really glad that that's not just, you know, that once they've made the payment and actually it's interesting, I had spoken to a number of adjusters who said that they have seen cases where um, they've had to go back to an, uh, to an insurer two or three times because additional damage was, was discovered on a, on a particular um, claim. So uh, I'm glad he verified that. Yeah, no, that's an excellent comment. Always, uh, Ed, we appreciate if you're still on the uh, briefing here. We appreciate you making that comment. Folks, our time is up. Thank you for being here today. Mark your calendars. And uh, if you're not an RIA member, now would be a good time for you to join the RIA. If you would like to be a part of the conversation with Mike Fulton uh, here in two weeks, we look forward to having you with us then. Uh, panelists, thank you so much. Everyone have an, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Mark. See you guys.